the spring of 2013, members of our thinking community gathered at the Geography of Hope Conference in Point Reyes, California. This year's conference was entitled Igniting the Green Fire, Finding Hope in Aldo Leopold's Land Ethic. The following presentation by Peter Forbes, farmer, conservationist, and founder of the Center for Whole Communities, addresses the topic of community, democracy, and the land. I want to give you a, a just really short, a, a different sort of uh, introduction to who I am, okay? Devil's Den. Sage's Ravine, Spruce Knob, Dickinson's Reach, Heron's Rip, Musalak, Arun River Valley, Central Harlem, Cedar Mesa, Chama River, Chichicastenango, Arch Rock, Drake's Beach for sure, Lake Atitlan, Glacier Bay, Knoll Farm. Now that's my biography. Those words, the places they tell my story. They're the waters, the food, the wood, the dreams, the memories that literally make up this guy standing in front of you. Those places define me. I'm an alchemy, if you will, of those places, your place, your home ground too, and the people who live there. So this is um, also part of my story. I'm the youngest son of a Jewish immigrant who fled poverty and politics in the Ukraine and arrived here in the 1930s, changed his name and his identity to get a job. He arrived here as part of the other. And that man gave me the land ethic that I have. The primary experience of nature that he had was diving off of fishing piers into the East River of Brooklyn, New York. And his struggle to find a home, a community, if you will, a piece of land, to create an identity that was respected by our democracy, those were all enormous sacrifices that he made that have left me forever privileged, right? His legacy really makes it possible for me to think about land without also thinking about identity. They're, they're linked for me. And when I think about the relationship between land, community, and democracy, I fail to honor my dad and myself without also asking for whom? For whom? And last night when I was watching that beautiful, beautiful film, I couldn't help but think of Estella Leopold and the land ethic. How much of this fabulous land ethic came from her womanness and her Hispanic culture? So you love this place, too, and I know you are of it. You know what I'm, I'm talking about. You know how special this place is on the very edge of continents, you know, this amazing place of forest, bay, and, and ocean. It's so rare, and it's so evocative. It's so special here. It's so special here that our culture has made it one of the most expensive places in the world. <laughs> And, you know, we can laugh about that, but it's frightening in a way, too. Mm -hmm. It's frightening. So will it become a biological and scenic museum, or will your kids be able to make their homes from its forests? Will people always be able to tie medicine bundles on its trees? Will everyone always be welcome here to love this place? How many of you know the word querencia? Just show of hands. Gary, I know. <laughs> I think Gary taught me the word. <laughs> Actually, the, the definition that I, I heard of it that's lasted with, with me the most is from a cultural anthropologist named Estevan Ariano. But querencia is a really important word in regards to our lives, in regards to the land ethic. So Estevan defined it. It's a mestizo word. So it comes from that Jewish North African culture that arrived you know, many, many hundreds of years ago in southwestern United States. So he defines querencia as the place where the animal lives. That's easy enough. It also means the tendency of humans to return to where they were born. 
Querencia also means our affection and our responsibility. Querencia means the space where one feels most secure, the place of one's memories. Now take this in. It also means the tendency to love and be loved. So that one word, and there are lots of other examples of words like it in other languages, suggest that our identity has always been intimately connected to our relationship to, to land and place, right? And we call someone today a genius, a genius, when that really means translated a person of a particular place. So we've almost lost, haven't we? Almost lost what that means, but not so much here. The land is there waiting for us, isn't it? All of us. There's no special membership to join it. There's no required education before you start it. It's open to bankers and farmers, people in, in business suits, and people who can't afford decent clothes at all. It doesn't care if you're young or old or brown or white. Our biology is hardwired to it. We are always seeking its rhythms. The sound of its heartbeat calls to us every moment of every day. And we answered this call when we play the banjo. We answered this call when we surf, when we dance. We answer this call when we stand in front of the ocean and just feel the power and the grace. Its voice is there in birds. Some of us taste it in particular in a ripe tomato, others in the kiss of a child or the, the feel of that stone that's been burnished by so many hundreds of thousands of storms. I'm mentioning this because that wonder is what binds us together. It's not there for some of us. It's there for all of us. And to care is not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not conservative or liberal, it's not environmental. To care is human. So I've, I've wrestled with two short statements that Leopold made that are like koans for me because I'm challenged by them and I turn them over and over in my thinking. And the first is the one you heard in the movie last night. There are two things that interest me, the relationship of people to each other and the relationship of people to land. I hear Estella in that. <laughs> This one is so rich for me because it asks a really important and difficult question. And I'm opposed to that to all of you. How do our relationships to one another shape the health of the land? That's what Leopold was asking us. He was saying our relationships with each other, that's what shapes the health of the land. And he's helped me to see that nothing affects the health of the land more of the, than the quality of those relationships. When we are greedy, when we are at odds, when we fear each other, when, when we treat someone as the other, when we are under, under the influence of spells and lies and myths, we hurt the land as much as we hurt ourselves. Every time. You see it in mountaintop removal, you see it in poisoned rivers, you see it in climate change. That is all failed human relationships. So if that's true, and I believe it is, then one of the most important and durable and lasting ways to heal the health of the land is to focus on healing relationships between people. Do you believe that? Yes. And now I come to the really hard part then. The most important way to heal people and relationships between people is to reconnect them to the land. 25 years of working in land conservation, I've come to learn that you cannot protect land from people. You can only protect land with people. I spent the last decade trying to do just that, strengthening the courage of really diverse people by bringing them together on a healthy piece of land to discover what they share, what they have in common, like Republican and Democratic state senators across our country working on climate change. They may not be able to have a civil dialogue in their legislatures, but they're able to communicate with each other on a piece of land. You know all of that. Last night, there was a prayer, and it began this way. We can be a gift 
to this planet. Did you all hear that? We can be a gift to this planet. Do you believe that? I hope so. I, I really do. I believe we can restore and we can repair. I believe we humans can do good. There's more biodiversity on my farm after 12 years of rotationally grazing it than there was before my family and I arrived there. I am not at my core evil, and I am not a cancer on this planet. With care and with knowledge and a lifetime of good intention, I can do good for the land, and so can you. We can change ourselves, and we can change this world of wounds. So Leopold was right about all of that, but there was something he was wrong about. And that's the second of the statements that I wanted to read to you. He said, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. I know how he feels, but I wish that man could have lived another 15 years. He could see that no one, even in their pain, even in his pain, lives in isolation. You know, one might also say one of the penalties of a social education, one of the penalties of living an aware, conscious life, is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Today, to care about people and to care about the land is to live in a world of wounds, yes. But what Leopold didn't live to see is the presence of a world of people of all colors, ages, incomes, who are holding up this planet right now along with us, loving her and they are the hope of democracy. Thanks. This production was made possible by the use of the facilities and services of the Community Media Center of Marin and through a partnership of the Center for Humans in Nature, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, the United States Forest Service, and Point Reyes Books. For more information and videos, and to join our thinking community, visit humansandnature.org.